My name is David, and this is The Big Shut-In. It is Monday, June the 1st, 2020. Day 79 since we began social distancing. And, man, this has been a weekend. The stuff that's just been happening this last week makes makes it almost silly to be talking about the difficulties of childcare and whether or not we might get sick. Because right now the country is on fire. Uh, Protests are in every major city and the violence is escalating and people are people are really fighting to have their voices be heard. Both uh, people who are speaking with righteousness and and people who are speaking with hatred and, and evil. And um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to keep equilibrium and equipoise and keep upright when um, I'm just so angry and sad and horrified by what I'm seeing on the news every day. But this is a podcast about COVID-19 and not about civil rights. And so I struggled a bit with what to do and what to say and who to talk to. And I ended up talking to my friend Daniel, who's one of my best friends. We lived together for several years. He was, he was my last roommate before I moved in with the woman who's now my wife. And he was the best man at our wedding. And uh, a lot of ways, professionally, he got me on the track to to where I am now. He, he's the, the guy who got me in into production and into event work, uh, which led to media production and and all the things I do now to make a living. And he is a black man and a student of history and a man of great intelligence. And he's someone who the conversations he and I had when we were really inseparable in my late twenties, um, really opened my eyes to a lot of things about the country and about the way it works, about the way race works and why. And he said something in a Facebook post yesterday that whizzed by as I'm scanning through the social media sphere, trying to find something to feel good about and make sense of all the stuff that's happening. And he said something along the lines of that the media is doing the country a great disservice by not acknowledging that the epidemic and the lockdown and these protests that are happening around the country, that those two things are by by thinking that those two things are separate when in fact they are connected they are part of the same thing and so we talked about that what is going on right now from his perspective and here's daniel so uh how how are you i'm good man i'm i'm i mean i'm personally like health wise good i've been there. <laughs> okay shape physically uh i i haven't really come to grips with like any sort of um my 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 full-on emotions so i just kind of think of myself in terms of like uh my physical being so feel pretty good uh but my 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 gut is good my head doesn't hurt my eyes see clearly my arms and legs work my back is strong so i'm feeling okay I, I'm not even sure I can say all of those things, honestly. Um, uh, my my eyes don't feel particularly clear. Um, my my back can't take much. I mean, what's your 
I don't even know where to start. What's your proximity to what's going down in Brooklyn right now? Are you seeing stuff out your window? Have you been? Have you been marching? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I uh, opted out of marching because. Uh, as I was saying, my physical being is good and strong right now, and I don't feel like putting that at risk right this second. I feel like I'll wait until things get a little bit more critical before I risk my actual skin, uh, just understanding that I'm at a higher risk. But we're in good proximity to a lot of the things that are going on. There's uh, Prospect Park is probably about a mile away from us, so that's about a 15-minute walk generally. So we were down by Grand Army Plaza and saw a little bit of the uh, protest developing yesterday. Uh, every other day, there's been a group that's been able to come down Fulton, so we've seen them. Um, I think they were out at Fulton and Nordstrand earlier, so they actually marched right by our window. I got a really nice shot of everybody and was doing the same 7 o'clock uh, ringing of the bells that I would do uh, for that group, which is pretty awesome. I mean... <sighs> What do you think? I really, I really have no idea how to begin this conversation, Daniel. I'm just, well, I'm, I'm beside myself. You know, I can't. I feel like every time I open up any kind of news outlet and look at it, I just, like, my heart just feels like it's going to fly out of my chest. Like, I, I just didn't. It, it really seems bad out there right now. I um, think that that is, it is bad. I'll, I'll uh, uh, align with you there that I, I agree that it is bad right now. I think that what is what we're seeing that is bad has been bad for a while, and I think now it's exposed, and I think that it can't begin to get fixed until it's exposed. So in that way, I think there's the potential for good, and I'm seeing a lot of different kinds of people lined up on the side of good. So that's also very encouraging. So those are two things that I take a lot of uh, encouragement from. So I don't feel like it's all bad. And I don't, I mean, it's a little bit worse than it has been, but I don't think it's that all that much worse than it has been. Because I think a lot of the things that we're seeing right now have been going wrong for a lot of people for a lot of the time, and it's just now becoming more physical. Tell me more, like what? What are the things that you think have been wrong for a long time? Well, I mean, we've got a structure in this country that's based around race, and it's also based around class, and it does a thing where it prevents people from moving up or moving beyond their station that they're born into. And that's been a thing that's been in existence and gotten worse in terms of inequality and you know, the issues around the wealth gap and things like that, those things have gotten much worse in the most recent time. And I think that this is at least bringing that to light. So like people are able to see that now. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I think you're right. I mean, my, I, I have sort of discomfort and fears on many levels as I think everybody does mm -hmm. around all this. And I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that I think, this is just sort of blowing the smoke away from stuff that is not only longstanding, that might even just be fundamental to the very structure of this nation, you know, which was built on, I mean, let's face it, it was built on a double genocide, you know, is the thing that like we killed one group of people to, to steal all their land and then imported another group of people to use as farm equipment. I mean, that's the history of this country, right? That's how, that's where our wealth comes from. Yeah, totally. Um, totally another group of people. Like, when you look at the great rise of America, the way that it worked and the way it happened so quickly in comparison to the nations of Europe, is that it was able to work with free land and free labor. <laughs> so that's that's how that happened in 200 that'll years help your, close to 2000. Yeah. That'll help your, uh, help your profit margin. Yeah, exactly. Pretty. And that's a debt that's owed, and that debt can't be paid back until it's accepted and acknowledged. And I think that a lot of the conversations that we're having nowadays are a lot of it is about white people being able to acknowledge that, which is great. Well, but the problem is that there are still so many white people who cannot refuse just like stick their fingers in their ears, like toddlers and go, la 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 la. I'm not listening. 
and, well, and I, brother, and that's, that's and, the toughest part of this conversation is that therein, I think, is where you and your fellows are going to have to step up. I I might have, you know, been able to hold some sway over people who are like-minded and open-minded enough to hear what I'm saying, but the people who are closed-minded will probably, their best chance is to listen to people that are looking like them because that's something that they connect with. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I wish I, I was the redneck whisperer, Dan, but I'm just not, you know? <laughs> I, I, well, you're going to have to whisper to the redneck whisperer and get him out there. Because I can't, I mean, I, I, I can, uh, you know, I mean, that's the, th- that's, and that's the thing though, is that, is that there's the current, you know, junta that's <laughs> running this country. And I can't think of a, another word for it really has built this beautiful propaganda wall where it's like this sort of anyone, box. anyone who disagrees with me is lying and you can tell they're lying because they disagree with me. Yeah. Yeah. And and so there's, it's so hard to like get any kind of other viewpoint or inform. It was like, well, you're just, you're just a liberal. And also the way the whole thing is sort of gerrymandered in favor, politically in favor of, you know, rural white voters, you know, have so much more political power than, than you or I do that it's like, we have to get like 70% of the country agreeing with us is not enough. We need 95%. But there's something to be change. said for us outnumbering them. Because it gives us that much more voice to be heard. Like, when I looked at the news, I saw that there were protests, yes, in L.A., in San Francisco, in New York, in Miami. But I also saw Des Moines. I also saw Montana. I also saw Maine. I saw places where... To be completely honest, there aren't a whole lot of black people, but there were still people out there with Black Lives Matter uh, posters and things like that. And, you know, some of that is because it's the thing to do right now, but some of it is also that the times we are in, and I, I put the blame or I put the credit to the administration on this, they've managed to other so many people that would have otherwise been naturally aligned with them, specifically white people, that they are increasing the ranks of their opposition and we are their opposition. So our ranks are growing. Theirs are getting smaller and they were already, you know, just one third of the country at best. Yeah, but it was the right one third, wasn't it? No pun intended. <laughs> it's, a, it's a key one third, definitely in <laughs> key places electorally, but I don't know that that's going to hold. I, I, I think it's still going to be a fight. And I think that he's going to pivot from saying that he's, built the greatest economy in the past uh, three years that he inherited eight years of beforehand to saying that he's a law and order candidate. But I think that that's going to be a specious argument too. And we're going to pivot and prove him wrong there. And if that means that we have to get more sheriffs to come along to our side, then that's the work that we have to do. There's already some that are there. So it's about getting those people energized to bring more people along. I I know that this country was fundamentally built on theft, and in the recent years, I've gotten away from thinking that the place is intrinsically good or bad, but I know that it's dynamic, it's flexible, it can bend and change. So that's the work that's ahead of us. Well, I start going down a historical rabbit hole with this where yeah yes i think the country is fundamentally built on theft but sort of every great nation every empire by definition was built on theft every 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 political power every at any level any piece of political power is based on taking power from someone else any great accumulation of wealth is based on taking someone else's wealth and so it's like we're fighting, I don't know, are human beings even capable of building something better? Or is this just what we do every now and then? Is just elect a monster and start killing each other. Like, is that just, is that just what people are is where I get to sometimes with this. 
Yeah, I think I think that this this country is built on um, amplifying human nature in ways good and bad, but it's built on doing that in ways good and bad. So there's there's a chance to, you know, get some good out of it. It just is going to take work, and that's where the story gets probably a little bit sadder. Is that what is that work going to involve? Like it's already involved the loss of a hundred thousand lives over the course of two or three months. Well, get, draw that connection. You know, that's that. That's why. I mean, I, this is ostensibly a show <laughs> about yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID nineteen. Uh, mm-hmm. What? How? How are these things related? I, you said something the other day about you felt that the the media was um, performing a piece of malpractice by not drawing that connection. What what is that connection? Yeah, well, the the whole thing behind white supremacy in my mind is that it's almost kind of like a second mortgage and a third mortgage and a a, a remortgaging of the idea that there's something about being white that makes people who are white better than people who are black and more deserving of certain things. But those things that they are more deserving of, that they get more of, are still not given evenly. And it's almost like, all right, I'll give you the table scraps to keep you from starving, but you never really get a seat at the table, even as a white person in a certain class. Well, uh, most Most of us don't, really, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not really. And so... The idea of you, of a white person not being a black person, is sometimes the only thing that a white person has. And I think that COVID-19 showed that to be something that is not really, it's, it's, a, it's a difference without any real consequence to it, because we all have the same health. We will, you know, it might affect poor people, black people more, but there's no one who it won't affect at all. And if we don't fight the disease, it's going to affect everybody in some degree. You're going to lose, you know, men that have walked on the moon as much as you're going to lose people who are out on the corner. The potential is there. And the fact that the powers that be decided not to really try and respond to this and treat everyone and the fact that we don't have something like universal health care that will treat everyone we ultimately are going to share the consequence of that because if there are people sick in a prison in upstate New York, they're going to get people in the town in upstate New York sick because they live in that town. They're the residents of that town and it doesn't matter what the skin color is. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've been most encouraged about uh, just recently is I've had so many of my white friends reach out to me to ask how I was doing and ask how they could help and ask what was going on and express general shock and surprise at the situation that we find ourselves in. But like I was saying before, I don't, I'm not necessarily too surprised at the situation that we find ourselves in because all of the ingredients were there for a very long time. The thing that's heartening to me is that there are people who, have more sway over the levers of power that are realizing that too now. And the police have been killing black people for a long time. So it can't be that it's, and, and God rest his soul, but it can't be that it was George Floyd's death that put them over. There was something else, I think, and I think that it was COVID-19 and the lack of any sort of response from the government. So you think this was just, this is just the match on the gasoline of, of anger about the about the epidemic. Yeah, I think I think there had been gasoline spilling from the hose for decades, for centuries, and the match came along, and the match was probably COVID nineteen, and it was struck really by George Floyd's death because everyone had been quiet at home, black and white watching their jobs go away, watching their savings dry up, watching themselves not be able to get any food. And they were doing it quietly because they thought they were doing it for a reason. And I think there's something about seeing the state 
willing to choke any man, black or white, out in the middle of the day that makes you wonder if the rest of this was BS or is it worthwhile or do the powers that be care that you've lost all these other things just recently? And I think that works for white and for black people. S- something that, that's really struck me because I was, I was shocked. I was shocked by the election of Donald Trump. And I was shocked by the forwarding of overt overtly white supremacist ideas, you know, of, of Steve Bannon ending up in the white house. (laughs) I mean, it's Mm -hmm. astonishing, you know, and I, I've really done a lot of soul searching in the past three years to try and understand that and try and, and I don't, but something that's really struck me is how, how ingrained, how ingrained racism is in people even in people who don't consider themselves racist where like, and it comes out in things like the healthcare debate, right? Where, where the, the argument from the right seems to be, we understand that this would help almost everyone, that everyone's expenses would go down. It would help small businesses. It would actually be less expensive, much less expensive for us as a nation to just have universal health care than to have this cockamamie system that yep. we have. But we are not willing to do it under any circumstances because we are afraid that someone will receive health care that we don't think deserves to receive health care. Exactly. Exactly. And that decision is made to the detriment of the people who they would even say do deserve to receive health care. Certainly. To themselves, to their own detriment. Yeah. 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 There is not a single person in this country really with with the possible exception of health insurance CEOs there's not a single person in this country who would not be better off if we had universal health care i yeah. think yeah exactly and there's and there's that's one example there's many other things like that like in terms of economics if there weren't if there was a chance for people to get out of dead end jobs whether that's through real uh benefits that they're receiving from work like health care or whether that's when they lose work they have realistic uh unemployment benefits those things that were able to give people a leg up and help them not just get back to where they were but thrive and and go further that would be an engine that would spark things it's the kind of thinking that we're going to need to get out of the morass that we're in currently but there's the thought that oh i mean you can hear mitch mcconnell or somebody say People are making more money on unemployment than they did when they were working. That doesn't mean something's wrong with unemployment. That means something's wrong with the amount of money they were making when they were working. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and you know, this, this whole idea, we're going to stop unemployment benefits because we want to encourage people to go back to work during a time when everyone was just laid off. Like, what work does he think they're going to go back to? Yeah, Exactly. And they're not supporting the businesses where these people were working. So what are they going to go back to anyway? Maybe if they were having a little bit more money lying in their pockets, which is what happened just recently, if you look like saving levels are up for the past couple months, that's great. That gives people a cushion, black and white, to do this sort of bootstrapping thing that the, go- that the right wing keeps on talking about as being a real thing. It's not. You need some sort of help to bootstrap. You need a loan. You need a boost. You need straps. <laughs> <laughs> you can't pull yourself up from your bootstraps if you don't have bootstraps. Exactly. Exactly. And that, if 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 they had a floor that no one had to worry about falling below, that would raise everyone's ceiling. It would lift everyone up. But there's an idea that there has to be this permanent underclass. There has to be this caste and they have to be untouchable in some degree and they have to be kept in that position. And there is an amount of labor that goes into, there's an amount of um, sweat equity on the part of people on the right to keep people down that isn't used towards 
advancing the country forward and is also keeping those people that are oppressed down. Well, so it's it like comes... this double whammy of energy. Like if you think about segregation, having to go around and put up two different water pipes, like that's that in and of itself is kind of dumb instead of just putting up one water fountain to split all these facilities and make a shittier one. Like, well, it comes back to the nature of of whiteness it comes back to the nature of wealth right like if the american dream is to be wealthy you can only be wealthy it's it's a um it it, it's like it's it's like a black and white situation right like it in the sense of light and dark right light only exists in contrast to darkness Mm -hmm. it has no meaning in any other sense right and and so you cannot be wealthy unless others are poor i can't be exceptional I can't be exceptional unless others are ordinary. I can't the be white is, unless someone is black. If you keep the two groups of people who are closest to the bottom at each other's throats, that will benefit the people at the top in some regard because they don't have to worry about competing for resources with the majority of people. But it, yeah, I mean, not only that, it defi- there is no top. <laughs> there is no top unless you do that. Yeah. Yeah, Unless exactly. you have a bottom, there's no top. Yeah. Right? If everyone's equal, then I then I can't be I can't be better. Yeah. Yeah. There's something that uh Tim Wise says about the Civil War in the South and how that was probably the greatest con game that was ever perpetuated on any group of Americans was in getting the southern states to secede because what they were doing was convincing poor whites to fight for rich whites' right to own black people. And what those poor whites were doing in that act was keeping the floor of income artificially low because there was a group of people who were forced to work for free. Right. (laughs) It's, It's pretty diabolical. Well, and and honestly, now it's not dissimilar with what goes on with Mexican and Central American immigrants right now. Yep, yep. Where we cannot let them into the system, you know, because then there's no one for, for <laughs> there's no one to be superior to. Exactly, you know? exactly. But they are every bit as essential as people who work in farms and fields in a country that's built on agriculture ever have been. Sure. Well, that's the question, right? Is is the American economy capable of not having a permanent underclass? We've never tried it. Is there such a thing as an American economy that does not have free or nearly free farm labor? There, there may well always be people who are on the lowest rung of the ladder. Those people should be protected and honored and fed and clothed and kept healthy because they are essential, as we've seen. They shouldn't be persecuted for being in that position. And they should be allowed through fruits of their own labor to rise up out of that level. Certainly. Certainly they should. I'm not talking about should. I'm talking about what is possible. As long as there is the work, there will be people somewhere in the globe that can come and do that kind of work. Those people should not be condemned to some sort of permanent underclass because they do that kind of work. That should be as noble as any other job. I agree with you. Yeah. However, I'm just saying there has never been an economy of the United States that did not have an oppressed underclass. It's never happened. Yep. That's because we've got this whole, you know, remortgaging of people's lives and souls behind this idea of white supremacy, which works to keep the very top as separate as possible from the bottom and the very bottom. I mean, look, I, so I, I, I am a, I am a white person and I grew up white in the suburbs in the South in the Mm eighties. That's some white right there. Right. Like Mm -hmm. it was, it was GI Joe and Ronald Reagan and NASA beating back the evil Soviets. And I, it was, I've had some very profound realizations in the second half of my life Mm -hmm. 
about the nature of the country. Where I grew up very taught, specifically taught, and, and never questioning really until much later, that th the country is fundamentally good. It's fundamentally on my side. If you don't do anything wrong, you're not going to get in trouble. Like these sort of, I mean, that those were the truths that I learned as a childhood, as a child, right? And, mm -hmm. and there's been a, there's been a series of kind of, of kind of, of, of realizations that have really rocked my, rocked my sense of reality shockingly late in my life shockingly recently mm -hmm. um w w one of them was that thing i said about i said earlier about you know how uh, that, how much people will will vote and choose against their own interests in favor of hatred and racism and right they will, they will literally make decisions that will make their lives worse rather than share with brown people. And that that's one of them. Another one that I'm realizing really just now, I mean, over the past few years, but looking at the video that's coming out of these protests of really, you know, of, of police vehicles just, just running people down in the village you know, this is not, this is not mm -hmm. like in Texas, you know, is that there are a couple of really different concepts of what a police force is for. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a war going on within major police forces of which one of these is the case. Yep. A, and it co comes down to the militarization of the police and all of this stuff. And, and it seems that one of those is sort of what we teach children police, police are for which is to help you when you're in trouble and to stop violence from happening and to, you know, uh, catch the bad guys. And this other idea of what a police force is for, which is to keep the black people over there, you know, keep, there's an undesirable element that will always be generationally undesirable and they need to be kept over there and quiet. Yeah. The because blue... they're dangerous, because they could revolt. Right, this thin blue line, you know, that seems to be what that is about. Yep. And I think they're, they're, I think, as shocking a realization as that was to me, I think certainly black people have been aware of that forever. And I think there's a yeah. lot of white people who would just acknowledge that, that that's the case. You know, I see those stupid flags, those stupid black and white uh, police pride flags with the, bla the yeah, black yeah, and white. Yeah, yeah, that's... With the blue line separating black and white? That's acknowledging the reverse of that angle, right? Like, they're they're looking at that as being a positive, that they are the men on the wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what's the wall? And what's it separating? You know? It, it's trying to keep people divided. Because there are people who benefit from people being divided. That's, <laughs> that's a foundational idea to this country. Of course. Of course it is. But how do we what we were talking about before, I think the message there is how do we how do we convince the people who are holding that wall that that is not benefiting them? <laughs> you know, the thing is, I don't know if you saw Chernobyl, but there was a line at the end of that Chernobyl miniseries where the scientist who was you know, trying to run the effort to control the fallout from the Chernobyl accident, said that you can choose to believe a lie, but the truth will always come out. Like, you can sit back and say, this is the lie, this is what I am going to accept. But the truth is always going to find its way out. And I think that's what COVID-19 was. It was a vehicle for the truth. And I think climate change is another vehicle for the truth. Like, I... I I don't I don't think that they can run the game forever. I think Trump is a sign that the engine of white supremacy is sort of running out of gas and is right now on its reserve tank because he is so blatant and obvious in trying to put his ideas forward. 
out of desperation. And I think that the right has been in this sort of downward slide because they realize they're going to lose the numbers game. And so they get more blatant and the dog whistle becomes a whistle, becomes a bell, becomes an air horn. I think that Trump is just doing them as loudly as he possibly can because he's desperate. He represents a desperate group of people because they know that they're going to ultimately lose at that game. As you can see, if you look out the window here on Fulton Street, you see the protesters marching of all colors and hues. Now, maybe that's not what it looks like in Nebraska, but there are people marching in Nebraska, too. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a patriot? Yeah, I still do. But I consider myself, it's funny, it's the second time I've asked that today, or, or at least used this line today, I consider myself to be a patriot of the sort of James Baldwin stripe, where I'm going to honestly appraise this country. I think that I own a piece of it because, you know, half of my ancestors were brought here as bond people to build it in, you know, some of the earliest days in the 18th century. So, yeah, I'm a patriot because I feel some, some amount of ownership of the thing, but I'm also not going to not turn a critical eye to it. The thing that has come about recently is that nationalism and patriotism have been conflated into one thing. And to me, they're different. Nationalism is something about, you know, loving the land and feeling that the land is your birthright. Whereas patriotism, at least in this country, is adherence to a set of ideals. And I think the framers, you know, they were probably the ones who, you know, they committed the original sin of slavery, but they committed the original sin philosophically of writing the Constitution because they wrote something so malleable but built on this ideal, and they tr- immediately tried to limit who that was supposed to appeal to, but it's such an appealing idea that they put down in paper that they can't get away from that spreading to everybody. I mean, I feel like that's the fundamental question of American history, right, is, is who is, in, in, you know, we the people, who is the we? Who gets, who gets to be part of that we and who doesn't? You know, and people's different ideas, profoundly different ideas of who is included in that we. They did a very dangerous thing because they put down all of these ideals of brotherhood and fellowship and equity. And pretty soon must have realized the danger in it. I think if you like go back to Hamilton or something, you can see what that debate forming. And they tried to limit who that could be granted to. But the fact that they wrote them down in the first place was the big problem. Because as soon as you speak those into reality, everyone is going to want to get after that. Freedom? I mean, it's, that's, a, that's an appealing thing. The idea that you can, you know, follow your own destiny, your own stars, do what you want with your life. That's a beautiful idea. And I mean, they framed it, so I'm just going to pick it up and take it to the bank as a check. Yeah, take them at their word. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to take them at their word. My name is David Hoffman, and this is The Big Shut-In. I produce the show. It's a production of Race Car Radio, racecarradio.com. If you have feedback for me or you have a story that you think I should hear, please feel free to reach out, the big shut in at racecarradio.com. Racecar Radio is a division of Citizen Racecar, Applied Imagination.